Welcome to AILA's first event of 2022. My name is Todd Terrazas, and I'm the executive director of the AILA community. You know, we're an uh, independent nonprofit here in Los Angeles uh, on a mission to expedite the innovations around social good, leveraging artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies. And so today we're uh, talking about investing in AI. We've got an amazing panel, uh, panel here of, you know, venture capitalists and, you know, focusing on the region and really focusing on how AI can benefit society. And so today we're going to be having a conversation with the panel for about 30 to 40 minutes. And so if you have any questions, please drop your questions in, in the in questions or comments inside the chat, and we'll definitely address them uh, when it's appropriate. And so definitely just, uh, you know, sit back, relax. You want to make this interactive. And so we're going to go, like I said, about 30, 40 minutes of conversation. And then we're totally going to open it up for you to ask your questions and we'll dig in deeper. And then, of course, after this panel discussion, we'll go into some virtual networking and uh, hope that you guys get to meet some uh, pretty amazing people in our community. And if you uh, didn't get to, you know, catch everything that, you know, we said, we're going to be making a copy of this. We're recording everything right now. And that will go back up onto our YouTube channel uh, after this event. So if you need to take notes, that's fine. But don't worry. Uh, everything will be recorded and you'll be able to uh, view it at uh, an on-demand uh, type scenario. And so I'll stop chatting and definitely start introducing our amazing panel right now. So we've got John Chen. Uh, from Fika Ventures, we got Peter Lee from Embark Ventures, we got uh, Z Holly from Good Growth Capital, and we got Joshua Arma from Wise Capital. And so we're going to kick it off with, uh, the, at least on my screen, uh, the person to my right, Joshua, to uh, you know introduce himself and his firm, and um, and then after that we'll go with Z Holly, John, and then Peter. And so uh, next up, Joshua, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Joshua Arma. I am based here in LA. I'm the managing partner at Weasse Capital. A uh, quick, you know, tidbit on my background. I spent the past decade as an AI researcher with the focus on fighting the urbanization of cities, which is essentially the overpopulation of cities. So our thesis is investing in companies that can address public issues so that we can convert them into scalable ventures. Uh, yeah, so I'm Z Hawley, and I'm a um, MIT trained engineer, serial entrepreneur, investor with Good Growth Capital. Uh, for over two decades, I've been uh, instigating and investing in innovation at the frontier. And um, Good Growth invests in early stage complex science and technology ventures, everything from pre seed to Series A, um, everything from health tech, data science, and uh, sustainability and material science. Everyone, I'm John Chen. Um, I'm one of the partners at Fika Ventures. Uh, we're an LA-based seed fund, um, founded in 2017. Um, three broad buckets in terms of theses, enterprise software, fintech, and marketplaces. And AI and ML is, is a sort of core thesis uh, through, throughout all of that. Um, we invest anywhere uh, from pre-seed to seed, um, to what we call it pre-series A. Uh, so no company is too early for us. and um, yeah, excited to be here. Thanks so much, Todd, for, for setting this up. So I'm Peter Lee from Embark Ventures. Um, we are an early stage deep tech focused um, fund. I'm based in Los Angeles. Uh, my background, I was an MIT roboticist early on. So a lot of my investments center around uh, robotic automation um, and applications of sort of verticalized AI in different industrial settings. Um, broadly, um, our fund will also do things in around um, synthetic biology, um, different areas, healthcare as well, um, through my partner. Amazing. And so to kick it off, I think we should really, you know, have each one of our panelists really define what does AI mean to you? So Peter, because you spoke last, how about you dig into what, what's your definition of AI and how you uh, invest in uh, quote unquote AI companies? Yeah. So for us, um, especially in the areas that I invest in, I think about it as um, you know, software that allows for intelligent automation um, or autonomy. Um, you know, the distinction for me is you know, there's been automation for decades. You, know, you think about CNC machining for manufacturing or you know, industrial robotics that move a, you know, a, a car part from point A to point B. Um, the limitation was they're not very flexible or adaptable. And so a lot of what we look at are the next level of automation where the environment may not be as, um, as constrained. 
uh, where there are um, uncertainties, there are changes happening um, in real time. And so the AI is there to enable the system to be able to react and optimize itself on the fly. Um, and so for us, we are much more around um, applied AI. So taking um, certain applications, whether it's you know computer vision or um, navigation, uh, things like that, and applying it to largely industrial settings. John? Oh, great. Yeah. Um, no, that's, that's fantastic. And um, yeah, for us, I think we, um, we have a, a fairly narrow sort of scope uh, around AI as well when we think about investing and specifically on the software layer. Um, where there's an end business or knowledge worker user. Um, so what we care a lot about is, um, is there a proprietary data set that is becoming better sort of over time? And is there a feedback loop or a mechanism around the UI that allows that data to continue to get better? Um, so, you know, the, the most, maybe the, the example that a lot of folks will resonate with is, is something like Grammarly, where it's not one of our portfolio companies, but um, for the sake of example, it's, it's a Chrome extension that sort of sits on top of your browser that will help you sort of edit um, uh, any any of the things that you're writing, whether it's an email or it's a Word doc, et cetera. Um, and it will help coach you on you know correcting your grammar and how to sort of clean up your sentences, et cetera. And uh, the feedback loop there is just that you know users will oftentimes make changes to those edits as well, and whenever something doesn't make sense, and so the the feedback loop there is very clear. The data continues to get better because humans are are in the loop and, and helping to to further that along. And so, um, for us in our portfolio, there's, there's a company called Arial.ai that's doing sort of the same thing, but in the mortgage and title space. And so, their whole vision is that they think they can automate the very sort of paper based, um, sort of paper intensive process that's that's the mortgage process right now so whenever whenever you sign up for a mortgage uh, for a home there's a lot of paper that's pushed to a lot of different parties that are double checking that data and actually in, in many cases they're printing out the pdf and rekeying it into another system um, but for Arial, they want to be able to um, have these same people that are keying them into the system be that feedback loop towards um, automating that that entire process and so we love the human in the loop sort of software AI uh, broadly, and that's that's really where we focus a lot of our time. In our case, um, we uh, I, I kind of think AI is uh, computers being able to think like a human, right? But a, a lot of times when we're talking about AI in startup situations, I think ML or machine learning might be a better uh, word to use. Um, it, it's a subset, but um, it's, it's the ability for the machine to learn. So because of a large, we think of, we think of ML or AI as being kind of a um, an overlay to a lot of the companies that we invest in. It's, it's uh, we invest in a lot of data science, but, that overlaps a lot with some of the health tech that we do. It also overlaps with some of the um, more sustainability things that we do. So, uh, for example, we're we're looking at a, um, a company called Blue Ocean Gear that's doing um, data in the oceans. Um, but then we also have a company called Aluna that is a spirometer. If you have asthma, you might know what a spirometer is. You can breathe into it, and it will tell you, and over time, um, be able to predict. Uh, person, sort of a personalized coach for when to um, anticipate an asthmatic attack. And so you can use less drugs uh, and less medication to manage your asthma. Um, and so definitely, like Peter was talking about, uh, we see AI as being a real tool. And um, as opposed to kind of the fundamental research piece of it. And at the same time, like John was talking about, um, we like to see uh, data uh, and and so the the sort of the ML is a, a is is a way of managing that data. So we see it as a kind of, I, I see personally as two things. So um, data becomes more valuable because you can understand it more. Big data, um, and I also see it as this whole concept of learning computers as not having to program as much as we used to. And so uh, what's really fascinating to me is the idea of the democratization of 
whether it's data or computing. And so it's really just a tool in, in many cases. And it's a tool that enables more people to, um, to access that data. Um, for me, the main focus of investing in AI is really around the concept of looking at modeling natural systems. So a lot of what we study is biomimicry and then how we can apply AI or the thesis of AI as it evolves into modern era. And a lot of, you know, this is machine intelligence. And as Christina talked about this, you know, the biggest problem is deciphering what is ethical AI, what is machine learning, and then deciphering what is worth investing in. So for us, a lot of our investments focus on social entrepreneurs that solve real world problems, but they're applying AI in a public service or in some type of, you know, social construct. So an example of this would be, for instance, like right now, we think about like whenever there's a wildfire in California, for instance, they're now looking at ways to use drones to predict where wildfires could happen to avoid disasters. That is an investment we want to make. So stuff like that, you know, we're really ambitious about looking at machine intelligence as a sandbox to do, uh, you know, deep learning, but at the same time to evolve out of that thinking into like, how do we actually build, you know, real world systems with AI at the centerpiece, as we all know, you know, there's a lot of adoption happening across the board, but, you know, most of this adoption is just deep learning versus the concept of, you know, true applied AI. Great. Which leads me into... Um... So for each of you, you know, when we're talking about AI, there's there's one uh, investing in companies that are actually building the core infrastructure, actually building out the algorithms and the real AI and techniques. Then there's the other side where you're you're leveraging unique applications of already pre-existing type AI applications, right? But you're using them in a new novel in a novel way. I was wondering, like, you know, from each one of your perspectives, uh, or each of you, you know, how you're investing maybe starting with Peter Lee, like, are you, you're purely deep tech, you're purely, you know, built, uh, investing in companies that are developing their core IP around the algorithms and the core techniques, right? Or are you also interested in companies that are just leveraging uh, unique ways of, of using existing uh, algorithms and off the shelf type AI techniques um, for different types of novel applications? Like, I can only imagine maybe like Grammarly, right? Maybe they're, they're leveraging uh, existing techniques and not building out their core infrastructure. So I'd love to learn more about where you stand when you do invest in companies um, and yeah, your approach to that. Yeah, um, so uh, in terms of your distinction, we're much more on the latter, which was the application of largely existing AI um, towards uh, what we think about as like a vertical solution. Um, we do have a couple of companies that uh, we feel would be more in the, um, you know, the, the former where they're pushing the boundaries of what AI is capable of. So we have. Uh oh. We lost them. An info. <laughs> Am I back? Wait, but... Can you hear me? Okay. I think Sorry. you're back. Yeah, my, my, my screen also fritzed out. <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure where I, I got lost, but. um. Uh, I, I, we have one company that is building uh, um, an AI chip. Um, and so that is um, fundamentally sort of at the low power ability to do inference on a, on a tiny chip um, where you have applications that are you know, power constrained. So that one, I would say, is actually pushing the boundary of what's possible. Um, but most of the stuff we do has, you know, it, it's um, applying AI to manufacturing processes so that um, you can have a new process for, in our case, forming metal. Um, we have stuff that is, you know, AI applied uh, toward autonomy for like mining or construction. Um, we have things in the supply chain sector where they're doing optimization of fleets. So, you know, most of what we do is uh, taking existing, you know, I guess you'd say, you know, AI algorithms, finding a vertical um, a solution or, you know, some kind of industrial problem and then building a full stack solution addressing that. Um, so AI is one component, um, but you know a lot of our companies have a hardware component, so they have to deliver you know um, some kind of value through you know moving objects or, or routing things in a different way. I think it might be like a, use, a useful time to mention. I don't know what um, how much experience the audience has with venture capital, but just to talk a little bit about how venture capital works and. 
um, the fact that a venture fund has what are called limited partners. They can't make dis investment decisions, but they invest their money and entrust the managing partners and the rest of the team to make really good investments in the fund. So they put money into a fund. And then the idea is that the, the fund will start returning capital. And then in general, it's supposed to return capital after 10 years, you can extend it a little bit. Um, and so what that means in the first three, two to three years is when you start making the investment. So it means that in theory, we're, we as venture capitalists are looking for investments that can exit in four to seven years. So um, so I think about AI, for example, um, three general buckets is where I might look at it as one of the applications, like what Peter is talking about. Um, and then you have, you know, what Todd is asking about kind of the fundamental, um, more fundamental um advancements in technology. And uh, I mean, the truth is that those are really hard to get a return on in a reasonable amount of time. VCs have to, you know, they, they answer to their LPs and they have to be returning money to their, to their LPs. Um, and then there is a kind of a middle bucket too. So we've invested in some real AI pi pioneers, we, you know, an MIT researcher, um, a team, Brago Jones and, and, um, his partner uh, who started Pienso and also uh, Igor Yablokov who had started um, Yammer, which was acquired by, uh, we didn't invest in Yammer, but that was acquired by Amazon, which became kind of the NLP behind um, Alexa. Um, so he started another company as well, um, who, which is doing more of this, like how do you apply, how do you create AI tools to enable people to add AI to what they're doing. So I think that's a really good middle ground. So sure, there's the applications piece, but there's also the, okay, let's take some of the awesome, you know, research that is, a lot of it is funded by, by the government. Um, you know, venture capitalists have some risk tolerance, but, but we don't do that really early stage as much. So I think that's another area that's really interesting to look at is that, um, is the tool space. And that kind of helps democratize a lot of that, the innovations that are happening in the AI space. Yeah, that's a fantastic point, actually. And, and um, yeah, certainly um, for, for Fika, I think we are uh, we are focused on the application sort of software layer, you know, where, where there's a business user, but also we have a company called Edge Impulse that is doing this tooling layer for developers, for engineers that want to um, specifically to be able to access the embedded devices that are on a lot of you know heavy machinery. In, in sort of heavy industrial settings and uh, be able to sort of uh, build um, ML applications on, on top of those sensors and, and leverage those sensors. And so um, the company's doing sort of extremely well. It's, it's, um, it's a freemium model where it's, it's free for developers to go try and then, you know, and they end up sort of getting a lot of interest from, from larger companies that end up trying this. And so it's just sort of this bottoms up motion there, but, but certainly yeah, outside of the, uh, application knowledge worker, there's the engineering dev tools, and then, um, yeah, the very sort of bottom, which is the, uh, the research, uh, technique layer is, is something I think to, uh, to, to Z's point that this is, uh, it may just fall outside the time horizon, um, for what, you know, LPs expect from venture firms. It's just, um, and it's, so a lot of times the, the monetization sort of path is not clear there as well. And so the more specific for us, the better um, in terms of the application. So, um, so yeah. Uh, Josh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So for me, I think there's a, there's a, there's a real opportunity for us to invest in this conversational AI space. I believe that the biggest opportunity right now is to look at on device, you know, training. So a lot of AI is right now in the cloud. So using edge computing, we can actually scale up conversational AI. And one of the biggest reasons this is important is because you have a lot of bilingual populations that live in major cities across that board. People are not able to access public services if they don't speak English. So when you think about like Hispanic speaking residents, when you think about Mandarin speaking residents or people that are from different countries, their dialect or their heavy accent to be gets in the way of them receiving public services. So we're looking at ways to invest in that space specifically to bridge the gap in communications because it's an applicable way that actually has real social impact. But also it is not like in a situation where, you know, we have to like experiment with, 
you know, real world catastrophe. What I mean by that is catastrophe could be anything from misinformation, data integrity, and other types of things that you, you know, you look at like a lot of AI or machine learning that's been deployed in social media, you know, people have been like, you know, fighting against it in some of the, you know, stuff happening in Congress right now with policymaking, with AI governance is personalized recommendation systems. So being able to like personalize, you know, content and shopping experiences, other things like that to everyday consumers right now is being, you know, limited where now you have to actually, you know, give a user a prompt to like say, yes, I want to allow your algorithm to give me personalized recommendations. And when you think about that, it's already shown that personal information is exploited at a large scale. So if we apply that into like public service where we can personally recommend services to people in need or that have access point for like the public service they are being offered. We're able to aggregate more public resources to people in need of that resource. And then there's a lot of arbitrage in that because there's about a trillion dollars worth of government grants that's going to be up for grabs in the next five years. So we're looking at ways for startups that can receive grant funding and also receive, you know, public private matching through us not only investing, but us supporting them in their AI research. So I'll just stop there and say that, you know, that's kind of like where I see my, my specific thesis fitting. I love what you're doing, Joshua. I'm wondering what is the mandate of your fund? Are you a um, double bottom line fund or who are, what are your uh, investors expecting out of the investments? So we're a quadruple bottom line fund. So you, right mm -hmm. now there's a, there's a concept called people profit in the planet and I've contributed to the Iris plus uh, system of standards with impact investing. And a lot of that is cool, but the, the, the fourth category is actually culture. So actually that's the, that's what quadruple bottom line is, is when you add culture, to people, profit, and the planet, you're actually adding the cultural element of, of the world, right? Our world operates on culture. And a lot of times people miss that, you know, context, right? Whether you have a spiritual background or, you know, a specific ethnic background, culture is a huge aspect of what I'm doing. And obviously, you know, being a diverse fund manager myself, my goal is not just to invest in, you know, uh, black and brown founders, but to uh, invest in populations affected by digital transformation, typically at an enterprise level. So when you think about enterprise, it's everything from government, nonprofit, and also uh, corporations, obviously. So, you know, a lot of my mandate right now is that the company is a social enterprise. They're using business as a force for good, which is, you know, around B Lab or B Corp certification. But, you know, holistically, they, you know, these companies have to make money, right? So we're looking at ways to make social impact profitable so we can use business as a force for good. And that's where my mandate stops with, you know, my LPs and people I'm working with. Cool. And all this talk about, you know, we're talking about government funding, right? The grants that you can get from like, say, NSF grants, right? Or NIH. Um, how, how is everyone working with like maybe uh, universities and tech transfer offices and these opportunities like these launch pads right out there where there's a mixture of, you know, public money being granted into research around these novel, uh, you know, this, this, uh, research grants being um, uh, allocated to these different uh, uh, research institutions and then also opportunities for you know taking that you know research from say a research uh, lab within say usc or ucla or caltech one of our local universities um and then trying to commercialize that is that part of any of your strategies because again you're all talking about investing more in the application aspect and right it doesn't really make feasible for you and your you know how you're your financial, um, how you're going to be able to return your um, uh, return value to LPs doesn't really work if you're at the very ground level. And so how are you trying to be competitive uh, where you can actually help identify early researchers, early, you know, innovators and, you know, be watching them, you know, from a bird's eye view, but then know when there's the opportunity to actually turn on your magic power, whether it's your network and then also your venture um, funding. Like, how are you working with tech transfer officers and also these other groups that are leveraging uh, federal grants? The, this might be a, a hot take, but what, what we what we typically find is that um, the the folks on the research side tend to be different than the the companies that end up sort of commercializing something all the way for at least from the soft the b2b software angle i i, I want to make that a very strong caveat is that um typically we find that um maybe there's there is some exception where there's a sort of researcher um on the team plus sort of a more 
product software business sort of minded CEO that can um, package that research into a product. But at least for Fika, I think what we've seen is, and we've seen sort of a number of different permutations of, of different founders coming through is that um, the, on, the, the research side does not necessarily lend itself to a product. And that's the key thing is like, what is the repeatable product that you can sell over and over again to a customer? Um, and so there's that sort of divergence. What, what we have seen, I said, I, I would say, um, maybe not on the research side, is that there's a lot of um, open source projects from you know companies like an Uber or, or Facebook or, or wherever that the teams that end up working on those spin out to start a new company. And so that in its way, it, its own way, is maybe um, a form of research where it's you know subsidized by by big tech versus by government um, or universities. Um, but yeah, we, we've seen we've seen that. But typically, we haven't we haven't seen as many sort of like research first companies um, sort of fail on the B two B side. Yeah, for us, um, and it's probably similar with with Z. Um, at least for uh, for Embark, about a third of our companies um, are spun out of university. Um, and obviously, you know, because we're deep tech focused, you know, we have a different thesis, a different um, domain that we're looking at. Um, it is. Uh, uh, weeding through a lot of a um, lot of conversations, a lot of professors, a lot of grad students, to find the ones who are entrepreneurial, who are customer focused versus technology only focused, and so um, it does take a lot of legwork um, to do that. Um, but we we've you know spent time at some of the key you know research, especially robotics institutes um, like MIT and and Harvard and Caltech. Um, well, we've done a number of investments. Um, so on those, we will find certain groups where there is technology that um, is very applicable when you apply it toward an industry. Um, but a lot of it is based on the domain that, that we invest in. Um, and so it just becomes a more natural fit with, with how we, we look at opportunities. And, and the, I guess the last thing I would say is on the government side, um, probably similar, maybe about 30% of our companies, even after they raise capital, will continue to raise uh, money through grants. And a lot of them, whether it's through like the NFF, NSFs or like a lot of ours are like through NASA or um, some like Air Force, where they have very specific um, technical needs they're looking for. Um, and I'm thinking specifically around like manufacturing, where they have a need around a manufacturing technology. And one company that we invested in um, is sort of serving uh, a, a gap in their capability. And so they're able to get quite a lot of dollars um, through that avenue as well. Yeah, I mean, universities are my jam. I started, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> you know, two, over two decades ago, I started the Deshpande Center at MIT when people thought MIT doesn't need any help. Well, in fact, most faculty at MIT at that time had no clue how to start a business or if they wanted to, you know, and so um, I think that since then there have been uh, tons of programs and and um, liaisons and the tech tech transfer offices have become a bit more um, open and and sort of um, industry focused and and so I think that what's really valuable are these are our programs at universities. In fact, Phil, who's in the chat here, he's uh, out there. I mean, he, he was running at USC when I was the vice provost for innovation at USC, um, you know, program that was a, an industry liaison with, you know, Hollywood and the cinematic arts school. So lots of efforts in doing that. And I do think that a lot of the faculty who have had industry funding tend to have much um, better understandings of some of the applications. And, you know, I, I hesitate because I think that you can go too far with this. I think that, um, you know, one of the most amazing things about academia is that you are in it for the pure pursuit of knowledge and um, curiosity, right? And so you don't want to um, shortchange that process. And at the same time, sometimes you want to get that out into the world. And so some of the most effective ways of doing that may not be, it could be a startup. It could also be the students that you create and send out into the world. You know, the U-Haul moving van is the greatest tech transfer vehicle out there. Um, but I, I do think that these programs have been incredibly effective in trying to prepare 
the academics to understand what it takes and if they really want to do it and then help pair them with the business community. There's a cultural gap too. So um, so I think those programs are very effective and very helpful. Um, but we ourselves as a fund, um, so our founding managing partners, uh, Maureen Boyce and Amy Salzauer have started several companies that were spun out of universities. We have Lita Nelson, who is the tech transfer, who is the head of tech transfer at MIT for, for decades and is kind of like the most <laughs> well-known tech transfer person. Like we love that kind of stuff and it's still really hard. Awesome. Um, I guess one thing I'll note, you know, I've, I've come across this a lot because I still write code about 40 hours a week and, um, you know, I'm actively working on IP. You know, I think there's a report by Forbes where about, you know, maybe, you know, out of 2.1 million active U.S. patents, about maybe 5% were actually commercialized. So when you think about that, you know, it's like a graveyard of knowledge in the sense that sometimes when you look at university, even for us at Weyasi Capital, one of the things we've actually had to be very bullish on is what hasn't been invented and really actually take a research-focused approach with startups because a lot of startups are not doing R&D. Like, they'll go to market with their technology. They'll, you know, get money and be successful sometimes. But then at the same time, they're not necessarily having any governance around their solution. So a lot of times in AI, you know, Facebook has already exploited enough users. And that's one of the things we're actually going against is trying to look at how can we actually do this right the first time before companies go to market. And with tech transfer, you know, one of the biggest problems is how long would a patent actually be a utility? In uh, every evolving space where you have like AI machine learning spaces that are constantly evolving, you know, there's going to be a huge discrepancy in terms of what we might say is IP today versus like good old fashioned AI or symbolic reasoning. Right. So a lot of the IP that may even sit in the university might not even be applicable for this decade's worth of problems. So I think a lot of the issue right now we've been looking at has been in how to not just like look at tech transfer, but how to actually get universities to become limited partners so that they're actually investing in innovation as it's happening versus it being locked up in university research, which a lot of the times there's no like, uh, you know, actual accelerator model at most universities. I think, I think like Stanford has an actual accelerator. So does Berkeley. A lot of Bay Area universities have their own, you know, uh, focus on venture. Right. And then you go to other traditional schools. They don't even know what the word startup really means in terms of, you know, commercializing the IP. And um, I spent some time in Nebraska. They did a huge effort in med tech to be able to like, you know, not only go out the grant funding, but to actually turn some of these, uh, you know, commercialization opportunities from their in-house IP portfolio into startups and then actually seed them with money. So I think a lot of it is going to really come from funding student researchers and then flipping those student researchers into, you know, early stage investment opportunities for, you know, venture capitalists that want to participate in the university landscape. And that really leads into like the question, you know, part of this event, right? Invest in AI, why LA is going to be the next superstar. And, you know, uh, it was referring to this Brookings Institute report that, you know, surveyed all these metropolitans across you know, the United States and identified obviously Silicon Valley as the superstar, right? They've got everything from, you know, all the, you know, the most AI job postings, they've got all these conference papers, they've got, you know, federal contracts, they've got all the things, AI companies, they're, you know, everyone looks towards Silicon Valley always for innovation and like, how can we replicate this in our city? And, you know, for Los Angeles, right, we're, you know, considered an early adopter. And where we're really falling behind is around conference papers by chance, uh, actually. Um, it's around federal contracts and, of course, the AI job market. And so, you know, from what, you know, like Joshua and everyone else, and Z and, and Peter and John have been talking about, you know, this uh, developing these better relationships with universities, but then also, I guess, I don't know. Uh, obviously, uh, universities have their own issues uh, when it comes to tech transfer and uh, how they want to commercialize. And even that relationship between university and student, I feel like there might, might be still a disconnect there because I know that um, there's definitely people from my, from my experience, from my friends that are PhDs, um, they tell me that, you know, they have always been afraid of the tech transfer office because they feel like it would slow down their process of actually getting out there and spinning out a, a company into what they really want. Right. And so this is not the conversation I really want to have on this panel, right? Because we don't have anyone from tech transfer office yet. But I guess like my, my real question to this is that given that there's a lot of innovations coming out of these, you know, local universities, especially here in Los Angeles, you know, we've got USC, Caltech and uh, UCLA, to name the first three. 
what can we do as an ecosystem? What can we do? What can you do as VCs to really help develop our community, really help develop Los Angeles into that quote unquote superstar that could be uh, more like a, um, a Silicon Valley? Like what else is necessary? Because I see Amazon, for example, giving big investment to USC to develop an entire department around trusted AI. I see Meta, right, formerly Facebook, investing again heavily into USC to develop an entire new department to help engineers understand the cultural uh, uh, implications of, you know, um, the implications of the technologies that they're building, right, from a cultural standpoint. They want to make them more trusted engineers is how they uh, uh, coin it. And then at UCLA, of course, they've got, um, uh, what was it, the critical internet inquiry uh, that is run by uh, Dr. Sophia Noble, um, uh, the writer of the algorithm, uh, Algorithms of Oppression. And, you know, we've got all these great universities, you know, that are getting this big corporate uh, influx of money and attention to focus on, again, trustworthy AI. And so I will stop my rant to get, to have your, uh, to get you all to start uh, having your own conversation around this. If, AI, if Los Angeles wants to actually compete within the AI market, you know, from a global scale, you know, how can we as a community really actually, again, make sure that the talent staying here, that we're upscaling, we're filling that gap of the needed talent that we need. And how can we help attract, I guess, more federal dollars, federal grants, more conference papers, really incentivize more people to be working uh, and researching AI and developing the, uh, the commercialized applications here in Los Angeles. Um, again, from a venture capital standpoint, it would be a great point of view to hear from. And then also just from a community standpoint, like what can we do together? So I, I'll jump in. So um, as a VC, obviously we're looking for companies. And you know, one of the things that we thought about when we launched Embark are you know, in LA or Southern California, what are industries that we are the best in, you know, the, the center of grab center of the universe um, in this industry is here, or at least um, a significant portion here. So obviously people think about the entertainment industry, but on, on the stuff we look at, there's manufacturing. LA has been one of the largest manufacturing, you know, regions in the world. Um, aerospace, a lot of traditional aerospace companies here and now SpaceX and then supply chain logistics, you know, with the port of LA, uh, port of Long Beach. And so those are three areas where I feel like if, if companies are built innovating in these areas um, and they started in L.A., there's so much talent from an industry perspective that when you match them up with some of the technologists, you know, on the software and AI side, you really have a competitive advantage. And so I think for us, we think about it starting there versus necessarily starting from university, though I do believe that there's a lot of uh, need and, and, you know, funding that can go toward university to push it more. Um, we felt like from, from a building a company standpoint, um, having companies in, in some of those sectors um, give LA a, a much bigger advantage than you know, maybe somewhere else that doesn't have the, the core base that we have. Yeah, I totally agree with Peter. I think it really does depend on starting with our strengths. And I would say when it comes to AI in general, uh, follow the data. Right. So one of the reasons why Silicon Valley is such an AI powerhouse is because you have uh, big tech there with all that data, Facebook and Google, et cetera. Right. But there's also other industries that have lots of data. I mean, how about Hollywood? Right. Um, and of course, I've been a huge uh, fan and evangelist for manufacturing and logistics as well. Um, there's a lot of opportunities there um, and aerospace as well. So. Um, I do, I do think that that's where we need to focus. Um, one other thought is that, uh, so there's a paper written, um, quite a while ago. And then I think a follow-up about ten, a decade ago by Annalise Saxenian. And so she's a researcher, I think at Stanford or, or, um, or Berkeley, but forgive me. Um, but she was comparing at the time, um, the ecosystems of Boston and, um, the Bay area, because back, you know, several decades ago, those were kind of the competing tech hubs and looking at where innovation and startups are coming from, where the patents were coming from, where the startups were coming from. And um, when she looked at the those two ecosystems, um, they were approximately equal in terms of spin outs from universities. Um, and where the difference was were spin outs from large companies. So um, the Bay Area was much better at spinning out talent and being open to that kind of open um, 
dialogue and connection of collaborations with with startups and big companies. And so it made the Bay Area twice as big. And then it started that ended up feeding that economy. And when you think about LA versus the Bay Area, I don't know exactly the numbers in the Bay Area, but they have a they have a ton of Fortune uh, 500 companies. In LA, we we only have one Fortune 100 company. I think we may have three Fortune 300 companies, um, and so that is a challenge. So I think that if there were um, if there were more large companies that were open to engaging in that entrepreneurial ecosystem, we would be better off. No, to, to all those points totally resonate uh, from both Peter and Z. I think um, I, I just even look at, you know, the unicorns that are in L.A. today and how they sort of don't actually cross pollinate all too much, at least in my experience. You have Dave.com, which is like right in the middle of the city. You have ZipRecruiter out in Santa Monica. Snap, you know, obviously is on in Venice. SpaceX is in Hawthorne. Service Titan is, is out in Glendale. And it seems like those mafias like are, are fairly insular. So every time we see a SpaceX company, it's always um, our SpaceX spin out. It's always with a, a bunch of other SpaceX folks. But there's there's not sort of this, oh, we picked someone up from here or there uh, at, at some other unicorn in L.A. And so there's probably just work to be done, um, even again, outside of even touching universities, like cross pollinating, like the best people from all of the top companies in L.A. But then also, of course, exposing those folks to to the university side as well so that um, there, there could be sort of, uh, you know, sort of good, good connection there. So, so yeah, I think it, it's, I can't tell if it's, because um, when I fl reflect back to um, the Bay, because uh, I spent uh, a number of years there as well, it's like I, everything obviously like revolved around Stanford, Sand Hill evolved around Stanford, and then maybe it, it broadened out to San Jose as well, and then it moved up to SF. Um, but but distance and geography wise, it's, it, maybe it's just as far you know as as some of these companies are situated in LA, and so I don't I can't tell if it's a density problem or if it's a cultural piece or whether we haven't decided like where the hub is, like if it's Santa Monica on the west Good side, luck. Of LA and, or Glendale, and so um, yeah, the, a lot of open questions on that front. But certainly, there's a lot of work to be done in just getting people together. I'll just say that, you know, for me, the reason why L.A. is a, the, 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 the next superstar, in my opinion, is because um, if y'all guess that what is the, busy, the biggest export in the world is actually culture. Spotify, Facebook and all these major tech companies y'all mentioning actually export information from people at a massive scale. But think about L.A. from a human standpoint, you know, there's 10 million consumers here and their personal income represents about half a trillion dollars yearly. So when you think about what is a better playground to build social infrastructure, L.A. is top of the top. And one of the biggest things L.A. actually has in its advantages is that it has mass produced more consumer products than any other city or country when it comes to entertainment and media. And we think about all the data that's collected through entertainment and media, it could cross pollinate to industry. And I think one of, for me personally, living in the Bay Area and being an AI researcher there literally, I left LA, I mean, I left Silicon Valley because the culture was lacking. You know, I, I wanted to connect with people. And, you know, I had to get out of my own head in, in the sense that a lot of, you know, the biggest problems in Silicon Valley is you can't solve people problems from behind the laptop. So when you're actually in a place like LA, you get a chance to actually see the users that actually end up benefiting from, you know, this technology. And I think one of the biggest opportunities that you're seeing, even while Miami and other cities are starting to erupt as alternatives to Silicon Valley, is because they always have been cultural hubs. When you think about Miami as an example, that is the gateway to Latin America. When you think about LA, that is the gateway to, you know, international business, including you know, South America. So we have a lot of assets here, especially when you think about the diversity piece, that when you want to prove scale from a B2C standpoint or even just from an ethics standpoint, we have the territory already mapped. The biggest problem is alignment. A lot of capital is not aligned to social infrastructure. Most people are more so focusing on the next unicorn, decacorn, or how they could, you know, scale that. But in L.A., I think one of the biggest opportunities we have is actually innovating within a diverse community. Like, for instance, L.A. is the only black corridor west of Chicago. And what I mean by black corridor is a place we can find black businesses that are small enough to work with. 
You know, so Crenshaw Boulevard represents an actual black corridor west of Chicago, right? It's the only one on the West Coast. There's a very significant thing that LA has. There's still a huge community at a county level, not at a city level, where we can actually innovate with multiple counties, but at the same time, the diversify impact within a, you know, you know, 60 mile radius, you know? So I think huge opportunity there for um, LA to be a superstar, at least when it comes to, you know, diversity. And one last thing I mentioned is that LA is actually one of the only cities, if not the only city where you'll have a lot of African-American and diverse fund managers. There's more diverse fund managers here in the radius than any other city or country in the world when it comes to women-led funds, black-led funds, or on, 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 you know, down the list, right? So I think there's a true opportunity to connect capital to startups, and that's what we could be leaders in, is in culture and in, in investing in that culture piece, that quadruple bottom line piece I talked about earlier. That I love what you're saying, Joshua. And I think um, there is such a missed opportunity in Silicon Valley. I mean, our, our brethren up in the Bay Area are fighting over deals with, with like term sheets within days and not, no chance for due diligence with crazy valuations because what they see, and I think the pandemic has even uh, fed this because it's really hard. You know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to network into the tech community. I mean, it used to be that you just up and move to the Bay Area and then you can do networking events and then you can meet all the people that are the, you know, the players. Or if you want to be a screenwriter, you move to LA and you meet everybody. It's really hard in a pandemic for that serendipity. But that said, I think that um, we have a different mindset here. And I think that we have um, access to a lot more really interesting deals that are a little bit under the radar. We haven't lost an opportunity yet. And it's not because our deal, the deals aren't awesome. It's actually, we, we get a lot of Silicon Valley uh, investors in the next deal that is super oversubscribed, but we find them early. And I think that that diversity in LA, and I mean diversity, it's not just, I think we need to think about diversity, not just the way you look, but the way you think, your background, the industry, so many industries that are really core to our economy here. I think that um, it's, a, it's a, well, I wouldn't call it a melting pot. I call it a bento box where, uh, you know, I forgot who was mentioning how we're, uh, I think it was John, you know, that we're, we're a little bit uh, separate from each other and we don't cross pollinate enough. But I think that there's so much diversity here that that is absolutely our strength. There's a comment in the, um, from Phil um, focusing more about, you know, the, the pandemic and how, you know, the great res resignation, right? Like people are doing more remote work. Um, and so locations uh, less important, right? Uh, how are you seeing your, uh, your portfolio companies and even companies that you're investing in um, uh, dealing with this remote work, um, you know, having more remote workers instead of them all being inside the same, you know, you know, co-working space or just office, right, uh, in Los Angeles? Like, uh, how are you approaching uh, teams that uh, have distributed um, team members? Well, we've worked remote mostly. We're, we're our, our main headquarters are in South Carolina, and we also have a, an HQ in Boston. Um, but we, we meet remotely all the time, so it's really not that different. Um I think that uh, serendipity is a little harder in general for everyone, um, but because we have worked pretty remotely, I think we're pretty good at just being very proactive in trying to find opportunities. Um, yeah. So I think for us, it's actually an opportunity, but I do think that it's a challenge for some. I would just say that real quick that, you know, there's a company called GitLab and they actually started off as a remote uh, team. You know, the founder built a remote company, fully remote, and they scaled into a unicorn and they did it all remote with no office. They gave everything up. And one of the things that, you know, I've saw across, you know, some of my portfolio companies and across the board and with companies I mentor in Techstars and across the border is... Um, you know, knowledge management systems has been the hardest thing for people to keep access. Like you can't build relationships online the same as you can in person. So when you need your walking knowledge management system, you typically have an in-person structure. Now with all these digital tools, the biggest overlap that a lot of people are getting confused about with remote work is how to efficiently scale, you know, your team without people, you know, missing each other. So for instance, you might be working on a lot of stuff and running sprints and doing product. But when you need that, you know, cultural piece 
And like building culture remotely is the hardest thing, I think, for a lot of my portfolio companies, where it's like, how do you embed culture in a, in a Slack channel, right? It's a very difficult thing to, you know, you know, trade, you know, uh, you know, in office parties or in office collaboration or in office gatherings with Slack, right? Because that in-person time is actually for some people the lifeblood of water at a company for three to five years versus they're you know, every couple of years they move into new companies. So I think, um, you know, one of the biggest things we saw was the playbook GitLab has, you know, when I recommend it to people I know, especially my portfolio companies, they've been able to apply it. And it's really a beautiful, a beautiful playbook that, you know, people here should check out or, you know, people watching should check out because they built their whole company from start to now on a remote culture, which is like different, super different than normal. Um, let's take another question. Um, as AI is evolving so rapidly, are you investing in based on analysis of the tech? Uh, how well can you understand it and how well it addresses a problem or on the basis of the people and your impression of how skilled they are? All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know, separate, do you bet on the, the jockey or the horse? You know, is it the market, is it the product, the technology, is the team? Um, you know, I would say at seed stage, it's, it's the, the, it veers more toward the team and the capability. We lost um, Peter again. There we go. <laughs> Uh -oh. uh, sorry. Uh, so some kernel optimization, some differentiation. Uh, um, sorry, my internet's terrible. <laughs> okay, we got you back. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. So so it, it's all the things, but I would say at seed stage, um, we spend a lot more time thinking about the founder and the early team, um, and and hopefully trusting that their capabilities will um, will, will create a, a a great product and differentiation. Yeah, and to try to like put a finer point on it, because I can imagine being an, you know, an entrepreneur or prospective entrepreneur going like, what does that mean? You know, I haven't actually started a company before. Does that mean that I'm, I have no, there's no hope for me, right? And, and, and for us, you don't have to have been a serial entrepreneur. Um, but if you have a really, really strong, you know, point of view on the market and an opportunity and the technology that will address that need and um definitely something that's differentiated and is not like the pack because we don't like to pick winners in a very crowded field we want to we want to find a, an innovator that really understands the market unlike anyone else and and you know it could be something very niche you know but they they really understand it um we invested in a company for example that's doing um tools for investigators for example um that's just off the top of my head but so that's the key. And so you don't have to be a successful serial entrepreneur, but you really do need to understand, you know, your, the specific niche that you're going for and have a, a unique point of view and understand how your technology is going to apply to that. So I guess real quick, you know, really, cause I love what um, Z shared. I think, you know, one of the, one of my favorite books is by a woman named Angela Duckworth called Grits. And I think that's a real measuring stick for me in terms of startup investing that I look for. But outside of grit, you know, I'm really about AI governance. And the reason why I say that is, you know, academically, I have a GED. I never got a college degree. And a lot of the opportunities I was afforded came from actually just having grit and just getting in front of mentors and finding, you know, opportunities. And then outside of that, AI governance as a, as a model, right, is really about who can actually learn this type of information. I think that's really one of the things I look for in founders is like, how much are they looking to learn and be a problem solver? Because when you really think about a lot of AI startups or the startups in general, they're like experiments that are not validated. And that's typically product market fit. So when you look at like people that are like in that transition of raising capital and proving their thesis or whatever they're working on, you know, the biggest thing I've been looking at in the AI side is not have they built a proprietary system or how are they going to change the world, but more so how do they look within so that they're solving a problem that they're committed to. So typically that's instead of product market fit is founder market fit, right? So the founder, are they the right founder to solve that problem? Typically that is going to show within the, you know, quick, you know, conversation with someone like me. And I think a lot of people, you know, across the board, 
you know, they really just have to have grit in terms of being able to like get it done because, you know, typically you'll get caught up in either a situation where you're raising too much capital and you're, you have a you know overvalued company or you super successful, but you didn't actually help people. You just made a lot of money. So I try to look at a sweet spot in the middle where you're not too overvalued, but you're also able to, you know, make money with a purpose. Yeah. I'll just tag on to that. I mean, the, the whole issue of AI ethics is so important and the biases in, in AI. And if just by definition, you're taking data, you're putting algorithms on top of it. You're mediating that access to that data and analyzing that data. And so, um, and these best practices have not really been figured out yet. So we do put a huge priority on the founders having the right mindset being, you know, having integrity and having the right intentions to start, first of all, um, and and making sure that we have a cultural alignment with them. Um, that's really important to us. Our, we only invest in companies, so we're 100% ROI first, but we will only invest in companies that we think are going to have a positive impact on the world. So, um, so making sure that the team is aligned with that is really important. Yeah. Maybe one one last thing I'll I'll add on and something Joshua said really sparked this, which is like a founder once said to me that um, she was like, you know, I'm 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 building this product and people want to pay me. Uh, they're not willing to pay. They're they're paying me very. Uh, they're not paying me a lot to solve hard problems, but they're paying me a lot to solve easy problems. Um, and so this concept that like, especially in software, um, as it relates to B2B software, it's, there are certain applications of AI that solve big problems, but that are, are easy to solve. Um, and so uh, one example is just, um, there's a space that we've been looking at, uh, this company called Tavis, which is sort of deep fake for sales videos. Um, so this idea that like, you know, uh, hey, Peter, I noticed you work at Embark. Let me tell you more about Salesforce or let me tell you about more about that. And then it, they can actually do, it's like mail merge for video where it's like, oh, hey, Z, I noticed you work at Good Growth Capital. Let me tell you about Salesforce and then it'll do the whole thing. And it's it's lip syncing, you know, uh, and, and it feels like a real video that someone personalized and sent. And there actually isn't like an easier way to, um, obviously if you have, it, this applies for e-commerce as well, where if you, you know, Hey Todd, you bought this pair of shoes. Let me tell you about this other product. There isn't an easy way to actually do that, but it's actually not an entirely difficult problem to solve because there's a lot of off-the-shelf components that you can string together uh, to do this. But this company just was ripping um, because of you know clear product market fit, and there wasn't another way to go do this, even though the technology under the hood was very, again, uh, off-the-shelf, open source, nothing you know entirely defensible, and so. Um, I think, yeah, it, that, that's what I, that's what we always love to see as well, which is like, wh what is the big problem people are willing to pay a lot, you know, to, to solve, but, um, but that it's actually under the hood is not, you know, entirely rocket science to, to do. So, so you did invest in them? No, we, we ended up lo losing the deal to Sequoia, but yeah, that's, okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's another, that's another story for another time. That's kind of creepy though. I yes, it is. It is. Uh, it's it's borderline creepy, but it's we actually uh, had real the, we had the opportunity to invest in came. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but Cambridge Analytica, Theranos, a couple other companies, and we passed. <laughs> well, we're about up with time, and so I was wondering, like, final thoughts from everyone, like where we're at now as a, as an ecosystem here in Los Angeles, and where we want to go, like. What, what are your hopes? What, what are you uh, looking forward to in the future? And um, how, how can our community help? I'd love to hear, you know, from each of you. Um, yeah, I guess you're about your hopes um, and uh, your goals. And um, again, what um, any uh, piece of advice you could have for an entrepreneur that wants to go raise capital um, and someone that might want to like even start a company or uh, develop a company here in Los Angeles? Keep it simple, really understand a need, um, understand it really well. You don't have to be super fancy about it, but have a different point of view than other people. And um, yeah, I think uh, do it with, I, I love the idea of the cross pollination and just from an ecosystem perspective, I wanna see more of that. I wanna see 
um, you know, more startups as an investor with my investor hat on, I want to see more startups with founders that have a really under good understanding of how to take something to market and with some interesting technology. Um, so, but from a advice to founder standpoint, uh, first figure out if you really want to be an entrepreneur <laughs> and then, uh, if you do really understand your market and really, uh, just go for it. I guess what I would say is, you know, being a deep tech investor, um, you know, talking to a lot of founders, be customer focused, not tech focused. Um, I think the biggest trap we, we find with technologists is they love their tech and it's the greatest thing. And customers are like sort of in their, you know, in the background and it's like, that's just not going to work. So, you know, we, we definitely try to find that overlap where great, amazing technology background, but really, really passionate about customers. Um, and then one small, not uh, small, but like anecdote of, you know, we were talking, I think Z, you were talking about, you know, spin outside of large companies. You know, we want to see the PayPal mafia coming out of LA companies. And, you know, for me, you know, the, the SpaceX is one of these places that is just, it recruits and trains and puts people through an intense work experience, you know, and uh, a lot of entrepreneurs are Um, how Peter, we lost, we lost you at the last part. Being SpaceX becomes. We're investing in a uh, better internet for you. I'm sure it's really good. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I'll just let everyone go on. This is going to might take a while. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Uh, John? Yeah, I think um, maybe this is, yeah, this is more broad. This is something I always um, leave folks with on, on the founder pitching and storytelling side, which is like, you should just try to tell the story that no one else can tell. I think everyone you know, that's founding a company has like a very unique set of circumstances that get them to where they are. And a lot of people try to like fit their story into like what the, what Silicon Valley will want from them. Like, oh, I did like these three companies and I graduated from this school and I, you know, that's why I'm qualified to go do this thing. But there's a lot of sort of nuance, even in people's personal stories that never sort of show up in the pitch that, um, uh, that really just helped get a sense of, of that opportunity. To, to, to what Joshua said earlier, which is, you know, grit. Grit is really not because you worked at Facebook, Uber, and Google, and then decided to come out and do this company, and, and you're, you're, you know, you're a hot founder. It's, it's all the stuff in between that never shows up on a resume. And so, like, definitely lean into those stories. And we care a lot about that, you know, as, as, we, um, as we meet founders and, and get to know them. So, so, yeah, tell the story that no one else can tell. Awesome. So uh, real quick, what I'll do to leave you all with some very concrete uh, guidance. You know, I think there's two parts of this. One is for first time entrepreneurs. What I would say is, uh, you know, learn from small businesses. In L.A. specifically, there's 244 businesses in the city, in the county. And there's more women and minority owned businesses than anywhere else in the nation. That's an important thing to realize because some of the best experience you have in your community starts with the local business owner. And if you're doing something that's B2B or that's B2C, you can actually deal with just understanding from a business standpoint 101, right? What is business 101? What is startup 101? And then the bigger picture stuff like how to make millions of dollars will come later because when you build a long standing small business, most of those ethics are embedded in the next person, you know, in terms of who's next up. But as serial entrepreneurs, I would just say that, you know, uh, for those who have already succeeded, you know, in our running startups where are like looking at AI and other things like that, you know, get on a cap table of another founder. You know, when you raise a Series A or Series B, one of the biggest differences with Silicon Valley versus anywhere else is that founders invest in founders. It's actually one of the biggest reasons why people are able to raise capital faster, because you're actually able to get on a cap table of another founder and then bring them to the VC that invested in you. So when you think about like Andreessen Horowitz, their founders are investing in the next 
founder and then bring them to A16Z. So when you think about that network effect, that's a very hyper local, you know, like everybody's in this together kind of mindset. And that actually has to translate into companies in an ecosystem like LA. So for serial entrepreneurs, I'll just say, you know, get on the cap table of another founder and help them by writing a check, not just by giving them advice. If you actually believe in, you know, what they're doing. And outside of that, the bigger picture is, you know, we all need to be upskilled, whether you've learned, you know, a, 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 you know, you have 20 years in a skill or five months, all of us, all of our skills through AI and other, you know, technologies can be disrupted. So typically what happens is every so often our skills are no longer relevant. So it's important to upskill and always, you know, look for, you know, you know, cohorts like ideas or things that are happening in the community to like latch on to skills training because we always constantly have to reinvent ourselves every so often you cannot just sit in a silo thinking you're a master at something where I, I can tell you right now most people in academia as they love ai their knowledge is outdated you know and this is why a lot of times you have people coming out of university or other areas that they're applying themselves in startups but at the same time, it's more of a business play. So true entrepreneurs, you know, it's always about challenging yourself. So just always upskill yourself. Always look at, you know, getting on the cap table with another founder if you're already successful. And then lastly, like I said, if you're a first-time entrepreneur, you know, reach out to your local small businesses because they're a great place to start. That's awesome. It's a great way to end our, uh, our evening tonight. Um, Thank you all. Again, I'd love to, you know, give our roses to our uh, panelists. Um, thank you so much for uh, taking the time today to really educate our audience and really, you know, show why, you know, Los Angeles can be someday a, a superstar as it, it, no, uh, is it rightfully uh, should be. Um, and uh, thank you to all of our audience members who uh, came in today. Uh, someday, hopefully, we'll be back in person.